In February 2023, I was walking around the Boston Commons, honestly feeling pretty scared. The Northeastern United States was going through one of the worst polar vortexes on record, with record-breaking low temperatures and wind chill. And with threats of frostbite and hypothermia, the forecasts were clearly right. But was this cold actually a polar vortex? Or was polar vortex just a term to get people to click on news articles? And more importantly, what can the polar vortex teach us about humans' ability to adapt to change? Hello, Thud. First, we need to make a very important distinction. The term polar vortex is not just a name for abnormally cold weather. It's a real phenomenon. The polar vortex is a persistent low pressure system located above both the North and South Poles. And this large circulation of air in the stratosphere has wind speeds of over 150 miles an hour, with temperatures ranging from minus 60 to minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, just below the stratosphere where the polar vortex lives is the troposphere. The, the troposphere is the part of the atmosphere you and I experience as humans on Earth. It's where the storms we experience happen. Thunderstorms, snowstorms, hurricanes. And there's one really important feature in the troposphere that we need to talk about. The polar jet stream. The polar jet stream is a persistent narrow band of strong winds about five to 10 miles above the surface of the Earth. And it's important to note that the polar vortex, that low pressure system in the stratosphere, and the polar jet stream in the troposphere are two different atmospheric systems. However, just because the polar vortex and the polar jet stream are in different parts of the atmosphere does not mean they exist independent of each other. You see, our atmosphere operates like a fluid. Motion in one part of the atmosphere impacts another. And you can think of our atmosphere like a pool. If you make waves on one side of the pool, those waves are gonna propagate. So how do the polar vortex and the polar jet stream interact? Well, when the winds of the polar vortex are circulating incredibly quickly, the circulation of the polar vortex is trapping incredibly cold air over the poles. And this is great news for the jet stream. The polar jet stream acts as a boundary between the warmer tropical airs of the mid latitudes and equator and the cold Arctic air. So when the polar vortex is incredibly strong, the temperature gradient from the pole to the mid latitudes is actually quite stable. Thus the jet stream is more likely to follow a straight fast flow around the mid latitudes. But when the polar vortex starts to weaken, we start getting a wave like motion to the jet stream. And these undulations are known as Rossby waves. Rossby waves are inertial waves that form in a rotating fluid. And in this case, our rotating fluid is our atmosphere. And Rossby waves just want everything to be stable, so much so that they want to fix the temperature gradient from the poles to the equator so that it's consistent. So when the polar vortex is unstable, these waves will form to try to bring peace back into our atmosphere. More importantly, the warm air from the equator and the cold air from the Arctic are going to create ridges and troughs in the jet stream. Hi, Mishka. <laughs> Now, just to be clear, just because Rossby waves are in the jet stream does not imply that the area north of the jet stream will be incredibly cold, basically Arctic air. Fortunately, there is a way to predict whether that Arctic air from the polar vortex is going to escape and play a role in the jet stream, and more importantly, the troposphere. To do that, we need to pay attention to what's called sudden to do that, we need to pay attention to what's called sudden stratospheric warming. Now, the polar vortex is usually the spinning top circulating over the North Pole, just minding its own business. And the disruption of the polar vortex that ultimately causes incredibly cold air in the mid-latitudes 
starts with Rossby waves. Now, up until this point, we've only talked about Rossby waves on a 2D plane, looking down at a map. But Rossby waves operate in three dimensions. Ow, Mishka! With the stratosphere stacked on top of the troposphere in the right atmospheric conditions, Rossby waves in the troposphere are tall enough to reach the bottom of the stratosphere. And just like ocean waves, break the polar vortex, which leads to the polar vortex circulation slowing down and the cold air of the polar vortex warming rapidly from the air below. And that's our sudden stratospheric warming, the signal that the polar vortex is becoming unstable. See, once the polar vortex is unstable, it shifts or even splits. And that's where the polar jet stream and Rossby waves spring into action. The Rossby waves want one thing, consistency, specifically a consistent and stable temperature gradient. And a shifted or split polar vortex is anything but consistent. Hence why we get these huge swings of temperature when the polar vortex becomes unstable and those cold temperatures reach the mid latitudes. And isn't that just such a noble cause for our Rossby waves? I mean, we all crave stability, a sense of order so that we feel in control. But when that stability is interrupted, it's hard to find the inertia to get back on track. In those moments when everything feels like it's just spinning out of control, it can be tempting to just wait for things to settle, for the chaos to calm down. Stability isn't something we find, it's something we build one wave at a time. And all because our noble Rossby waves just wanted a little bit of stability.